it in here. All right. I'm going to be very candid with you. Oh. <laughs> we are living in a computer program reality. 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 That's, a, that's our Philip reality, K. Dick uh, telling us reality, about reality there. Reality. Is that actual audio? It is, yeah. Of Dick. Uh, welcome, yes. everyone, to Simulation Nation, your portal to all things virtual. I'm your host, Graham Tallman, and I'm here to keep you informed about all that's happening in virtual reality. Record our episodes live at Allspace every week. You can join us from your PC or VR headset. Just log into Allspace, join our Simulation Nation channel, and teleport in to offer your opinion, question, or whatever else. Today, we are very excited to have three guests from the Arthur C. Clarke Center for <clears throat> Human Imagination which seeks to understand, enhance, and enact the gift of human imagination by bringing together the inventive power of science and technology and the humanities. How cool is that? Joining us to discuss is author and assistant director, I think it's called, Patrick Coleman, uh, artist in residence, John Payton, and Robert Twalney. Ladies and gentlemen, give a warm emoji welcome to all three of these fine gents. Here we go. <laughs> Guys, so happy to have you here. This is awesome. I don't know, you know, I, I don't even know if we've ever had three guests. This is like the maximum the stage the stage goes here. So this is like this is like a, a full on a battle royal here. I love it. <laughs> it does have a sort of WWF feel. Six feet, six feet. Where are you? Six feet. We'll we'll see how the conversation goes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it, it is the good thing about having uh, your stage in virtual reality, where I could just say, okay, I want my stage to go from size five to size eight, and here we go. It's yeah. expanded, and yes. now it's bigger, and yeah. you know, scale uh, is cheap. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> So you guys are, uh, this is a, an amazing uh, event. I'm, I'm so happy to have you guys. I'm a huge fan, first of all, of Arthur C. Clarke, and I'm so excited to hear more about Arthur C. Clarke Foundation and what you guys are all up to. Uh, so, you know, we got to, there's a bunch of you here, so why don't we just dive right in? Um, Patrick, do you want to, do you want to start just sort of talking about the origin story of, let's start with you individually, and then we'll go into the Arthur C. Clarke Center. So. What is the origin story of Patrick Coleman? Yeah, uh, well, uh, thanks for having me, us, the Clark Center. You know, it's really great to kind of be a part of your community and to kind of feel the different communities on alt space, sort of building bridges in really wonderful ways. So it's just really exciting for for us to be here. Um, but yeah, so my personal origin story, I guess. Um, so I'm. Uh, at heart, uh, a writer. Um, I write fiction and poetry. I you know, did an MFA, you know, all the kind of typical things you might expect of an artist type person. Um, and coming out of that, I, when I moved to San Diego, um, gosh, about 11 years ago, uh, first started working in the art museum world. Um, so I was a curator at the San Diego Museum of Art. Um, really enjoyed oh, wow. that, that as a um, as a start, but the thing that I started to really love while I was there was not just working in one department with other curators, but working with the education team and the conservators and the scientists. And we had people coming over from UCSD doing, you know, high resolution scanning of objects and um, and just really hey, found hey, myself. Hey, hey Robert! Of... Hey, Robert! Over there, you're making too much noise. <laughs> <laughs> we we we're trying to hear the Patrick origin story. <laughs> <laughs> All um, right. Sorry. Sorry. I know he's gonna be. He's probably he's gonna be embarrassed when he hears the edit. So I might as well. I might as well tell him now. Um, I can see him blushing. It's okay. Yeah. Exactly. Um. But anyway. So yeah. So I was. I was there for you know a handful of years. Um. Was feeling more and more dissatisfied, and then I heard about this thing called the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. Um. And just the name alone, you know piqued my curiosity, and I've been here for five years. Um, so let me hand it off. I'm getting a little background noise here, too. OK, sure. Um, well, why don't we, John. so anyway, I think, uh, do you want to go next, Robert? Uh, it looks like, uh, John, you're, ba you're back there. You're, who wants to go next? Let's do Robert next, and then we'll do John. If you guys are ready. Um, OK. I, you want to know my origin story? I come from a very classical visual arts background, so it's very odd that I'm here in these spaces. 
I grew up in very rural areas of the United States, like southern uh, parts of South Carolina out in the countryside. And so I, I was a very fortunate person. got to go to school because I had a talent. I went to college on like an art scholarship. And what I gave up when I went to an all art school was my passion and love for the sciences. And of course, I'm a comic book nerd, sci-fi nerd. I grew up with all of that. So I'm a dyslexic person. I learned to read from comic books because I would draw the pictures. And when I would redraw the comic books, I would include all of the words as well which uh, hmm. my mom noticed early on and used that as a format to teach me how to read. And so throughout that kind of like journey, I dove way down into the technical side of art. I often was hired to do a lot of fabrication for people, specialty things it would kind of look like engineering. And along the way, it turned out I was pretty good with computers. And I fortunately met Robert because I decided I was uh, inspired by a mentor about the time I turned 30 that I didn't need to keep my side hobbies within science and my passion for learning them as separate from my art making. And I took some classes at the University of Washington where uh, through their DX Arts program where Robert was the first person who taught me coding as an adult. Oh, wow. And uh, we became friends there. And he saw my passion and curiosity and pushed me into going to UCSD to get my graduate degree. So I wound up here thanks to him in 2015. And that kind of steamrolled with me meeting people. Um, always artists are usually associated with creativity and imagination. So it's a kind of natural foray that they've always been associated with the humanities within the school. And I just found myself because of my love of combining artistic media mm -hmm. and technology with them. And so that's kind of how I came to be. And my big thing since in all of my time at UCSD was I got really into things like computer vision and recognizing early on. And I saw that transition. I wanted, I make masks. I do a lot of traditional wood carving and I wanted my things to have a life. If we look at the automatons of Da Vinci, we look at like the, the lion that he made back in the day. We look at things like the Vitruvian man and that's a core, that's a data visualization. And I look at how the arts and sciences come together, and really this kind of immersive space is, is where we can run with both the physical and the digital. And it, it's, it's like the proving ground. It's the next frontier. So that's my story. I hand it off to Robert. Hey. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, John and I have been friends for a number of years now. So, but um, yeah, so I, I guess I come, you know, I got into art through kind of drawing and painting growing up um, and ultimately studied biomedical engineering and art and over time I've kind of put those together sort of art and technology. Um, I'm currently a professor of emerging media arts and a researcher with the Clark Center. Um, but yeah, so so actually um, I came back to San Diego a few years ago um, to work as a postdoc with the Clark Center. I um, have always been deeply inspired by science fiction, um, and we just have an awesome group of people at the Clark Center that are doing, you know, spanning like neuroscience, you know, fiction, speculative futures, VR, AR, um, cog sci, you know, and different kinds of engineering and art. So, um, yeah, it's a super nourishing, like, you know, fascinating group to work with. Um, and I guess, you know, to some extent, if we're talking about AR and VR and XR today, you know, I think. Um, Painting for me was always embodied and kind of about like physical, you know, art was about sort of like physical expression in relation to like crafted objects. And I think the potential for bringing technology into real spaces, real contexts um, that we share with those technologies and thinking critically about that is like a pretty, you know, excellent, excellent angle to take on this emerging kind of, you know, XR, MR world. So, yeah, totally. so happy to be here. Yeah, awesome. That's so. There's, there's so much to unpack there. I wish I could go into all of yours in a little more detail. So, just just sort of touching on that last bit. Are do you mean like do you are you talking about like tilt brush that kind of stuff? Where you can actually paint within VR, or is that just one aspect? Or would you look at? That? I mean, like, I, I mean, I mean, for me, um, you know, I've done a lot of like electronics, Internet of Things, mechatronics, robotics. So I think about the ways that we augment our reality broadly and like computer graphics see through AR can be one or, or v, immersive VR can be one way, but also, you know, these other technologies also augment our reality in some way. So I think there's, we will see a merging of all those kinds of activities. Right. So yes, yeah. Yeah, so actually, yeah, it's funny. Yeah. I'm not, yeah. So may, I'd say maybe other things than tilt brush for me. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Got it. Got it. 
Okay, great. Well, um, I, I love that you guys are, uh, I, what your description is like artists in residence. Patrick, you're the, uh, is the assistant director. Is that, is that correct? That's right. Yeah. So then, then we've got artists in residence. And, and of course, here in our audience, we have uh, a Afterville in residence, Fidget. Uh, welcome back, Fidget. We'd love to see you here. If you guys haven't checked out her episode, it was a, a few weeks ago and uh, turned out really, really well. We've got Rebecca Evans and Nine Key and Tilt and Ben Father. Good to see you again. And Kurt. If anyone has any questions for our wonderful uh, a panel here, just let us know and we will jump into some. Um, I, maybe I'll take, a, it looks like John had a question, but I think we'll let John speak without having a question. Um, so, okay. So we had we had our, our, our uh, VR archivist in residence in Afterville, and now you guys are artists in residence in the, Phil, in, not the Philip K. Dick, the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation. So, Patrick, maybe you could just tell us about what exactly is the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation and what's sort of the origin story of that uh, organization. Sure. Yeah. So, so the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation um, was was started a, a number of years ago while while um, Sir Arthur was still alive, and it was some of his his friends and colleagues who um, kind of towards the end of his life. Um, had established a foundation to to carry on his legacy, you know, into the next hundred years, and um, and one of the things that Clark told him or told told this group was, you know, you know the, the way a lot of these work, you know, if there's like the Robert Heinlein Foundation, you know, they they kind of exist mostly to, you know, make sure his works are continued to be published and symposia are done about about his writing, which is really valuable, and there are there's plenty that's done with Clark. Um, but Clark really wanted kind of a, a different legacy and one where we we're inspired by his ability to bring together, you know, a, a passion for science, a, a talent in the arts, and this, this sort of sense of wonder and exploration that sort of infused his work in fiction and nonfiction. Um, so, so the Clark Foundation put out a call to um, to universities to start a, an Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination and um, I think they got you know 50 or some proposals, but UCSD um, was the one that they selected um, because you know one of the things we like to say is you know the university and really you know kind of all universities as a whole are centers of imagination in one way or another. Um, but the real thing that we um, said from the beginning is we wanted to bring together you know the 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 disciplines of of you know physics and and cognitive science and neuroscience with the expressive arts, you know, critical theory, um, you know, and, and cultural studies um, to find you know, new and productive ways to understand what imagination is, how it operates in, in the brain and in the mind, and how it operates, you know, across individuals in our culture. And then with a special interest in in speculative culture, you know, so inspired by Clark and and how we think about the future. Um, and so we have a whole series of research projects that come at those two big questions in all kinds of different ways. Um, but we've been going now for gosh, we're in, um, year seven, seven or eight at this point. The pandemic year kind of scrambled my sense of time. Um, <laughs> And uh, along the way, you know, you know, bringing in artists has been a really key part of that. Um, and so working with student artists, um, so artists in the MFA program here at UCSD, but also bringing science fiction writers to campus and um, visual artists um, to campus to work with scientists and work with each other. Maybe um, the most famous Clark Center project like that was when Kim Stanley Robinson and Marina Abramovic um, came to campus to collaborate um, a, a handful of years ago, kind of right before um, Stan's book, Aurora, came out. Um, and so some, some art came out of that, some writing came out of that. Um, and it was this really kind of wonderful moment of, uh, you know, seeing how these, uh, these two artists could also inspire, you know, the astrophysicists that were, that were there and the, um, this, you know, the technologists and engineers. Um, so yeah, so that's sort of the big, big picture overview origin story of the Clark Center. Got it. That's a that's amazing. And how cool is it that you can go to that center to get a, a an education from this incredible visionary? I, you know, he's got some of the best quotes in all of sci-fi, right? Like uh, any sufficient advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, which is basically where we are now. We're in the metaverse, guys. Like it's actually happening. It wasn't maybe when he was alive, but here we are. Um, 
And so at the center, when you study there, do you, do you, um, is the product, is it like a paper? You're, you're, cause you're talking a lot about research or is it more that you might write a story that's a speculative fiction and maybe Robert or John will uh, do some kind of artistic piece? Is that, how does that work? So the outputs can come in all kinds of different forms. Um, and, um, and one thing that I think is really exciting, you know, to me is to see sort of arts-based research on the same um, level as the kind of traditional science research outputs, you know, papers and um, number of references and all those kinds of things. Um, but you know, the thing too is, you know, we really think there's, there's, um, you know, there's all these false divides that have you know, been discussed, you know, the, the two cultures and, you know, right brain, left brain, and all of it's fairly nonsense. I mean, and I think, our, you know, Robert and John are really good examples um, of people that, you know, are amazing artists, um, amazing coders and engineers who are working with cognitive scientists to, you know, study, you know, brain dynamics of people who are looking at art at the San Diego Museum of Art um, and, you know, are part of those publications too. So it's finding, you know, a lot of it, you know, for me as the assistant director is helping sort of facilitate um, these maybe non-traditional groups of, of collaborators who are already just brilliant on their own and then together do all kinds of amazing new things. I think Patrick just well, said we're, we're the collective of nonsense. <laughs> the collective of nonsense. <laughs> I'm sure Arthur C. Clark would not be offended by that comment. I'm sure creativity and nonsense sometimes there's a fine line, right? So sometimes you have to go into the, the nonsense to find the, the genius, right? So sufficiently advanced creativity fed. is indistinguishable from nonsense. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> and I would exactly. Say part of the big thing of what we push is to make sure that people look at the things we do as is not nonsense like it's really easy for fields within academia to dismiss those that are are reaching for something further that have an imagination that goes way beyond and it's not nonsense which is uh we're proud of our nonsense we always own it but it's the thing that we want to be celebrated for and it's the thing that we want other people to celebrate with us i would say which is why i love that term totally that makes a lot of sense. Well, I want to, in a, in just a second, get into a little more specifics of John and Robert, what you guys are up to. But let's take a question from the audience here. So we've got some people, uh, Rebecca and Fidget and Ben Father. If anyone has any questions, let us know. Nine key. How's it going, Nine key? Pretty good. How are you doing? Great. Oh, confirm. You can hear me. All right. So I have a question for you guys because I'm familiar with all of your work, but and and you've all of you are very brilliant in all of your fields, but right now you are standing in Avatar, having an interview in virtual reality, being filmed, streamed to the real world with a, like a VR audience. Uh, you've, you've studied all of this your whole life and now you're just sort of like standing in the middle of it. What does it feel like to live in the middle of something that was fiction just five to six years ago and now here you are? Awesome question. We start with. I think uh, about. Who wants to start? Yeah, yeah. Go for it, Jeff, Robert. I think about. Um, I grew up in Northern Virginia, and I think sometime like, I'm going to date myself, but like 90, 92, 94, I went down to like UVA, I think, and saw like a demo in a tech lab that was a VR demo, put on a bulky headset with like a thick tethered cord. You moved your like lawnmower man type blocky hands around and picked up the like Stanford teapot or something. And um, yeah, it, you know, it's it's taken a while to like to be back in that kind of a space, but I'm not in a research lab. I'm sitting in my garage in a squeaky chair. Sorry, Graham. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's yeah. So I think um, I think it's I think for me, it's going to take a while for the ramifications to to shake out of like what that what that shift is about. Um, but but how wonderful to have, especially this year, right? To have new spaces to be and and meet, so. Yeah, and you know, for me, you know, I guess I think about being, gosh, probably like nine years old and reading Neuromancer, which is a really questionable book to have thrust upon a nine-year-old um, right. and feeling like, you know, totally blown away and like my imagination was on fire with those possibilities. And to be honest, I kind of drifted away from a lot of that kind of, you know, dreaming because 
I got caught up, you know, as I became a teen with like text-based online RPGs and things like that. Um, you know, so this was like, you know, CompuServe, Prodigy days, so dating myself as well. Um, and the thing that I would love about coming around to where we are now is that sense of community is very similar to what was what we what we kind of had in those like kind of early text-based forums, but with this different sense of presence. Um, to me, it's very, very powerful. Um, and I, I mean, I like to kind of jokingly, not jokingly say I'm kind of a technophobe, kind of a Luddite. Um, and even, you know, even VR, I was like, I don't know, it might be kind of a boondoggle. But the thing that really changed my mind, um, and it's funny that you're asking, Trishik, because it, you were the one who did this, is, you know, this last year and a half, um, we've all had a lot of weirdness. And I came from a, a, a Zoom funeral for a, an astrophysicist colleague of ours who passed away suddenly straight to Afterville, I, you know, from Zoom and put on my headset because we had a, a gathering there. And as soon as I popped in, Trisha was there. She said, how are you doing? And I was like, ah, I, I might need a minute. You know, this is just sort of a weird transition. And she just, you know, kind of came over, gave you a hug and gave me a hug like this. And even just every time I tell the story, and I've told it a lot of times, I still get the same chills that I got from that feeling of someone coming up, getting kind of intimate with you and comforting you, which, you know, wasn't, that wasn't something that we were getting pretending to be different, um, you know, Mon Calamari on these forums in the 90s. Um, and so, yeah, that's, right. that's the thing that I'm really just so amazed that we're able to do this and that you, know, you think about Clark, you know, who responsible for the idea of geosynchronous satellites so this whole telecommunications infrastructure that enables us to do this I, I feel like even this would would be blowing his mind how quickly you know we're all able to do what we're doing right now totally yeah and it's it's only a step away before you're going to be able to hug people in here with haptic suits and fit on your body <laughs> in the real world that's not so far away either right so this is only this is just like sort of say this is always like the original Nintendo Entertainment System, and then wait till the Nintendo 64 and the GameCube and the PS4, whatever, come along. It's uh, we're we're just at the the very beginning, but it's already has a lot of impact. And you can it doesn't take much imagination to add to the mix to understand what's to come from this. Yeah, you know, I, I still remember. Put... I think I was walking through Walmart as a kid. It was also in the 90s. Clearly, uh, many of us were young and burgeoning then. And there was the virtual boy. I could see it. I could like sit there and mm. lust after it. And I didn't care if it was red. I wanted to be in there. And the sheer difference between that and now is spectacular. Right. And I remember the, the magical feeling of just wanting that thing in like everybody saying how awful it was and reading the reviews. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. There's, there's majesty of like exchanging into something else, you know, to being able to, to really put it on and to see these technologies the last couple of years in particular in them every day every day doing something and like at the forefront i've tried everything i've been an alt space member i found out since 2017 in like one of their beta launches so i um, trying it off in the vibe and stuff like that and to, to come in here and be with people i love it and the thing that i love the most is changing people's minds who have 40 years of vr bias mm. that's what i get when i go out in the world as we talk to um in academia you know most people who have tenure are not young spring chickens and so, and the ones in the VR field that have been around are, are still slightly jaded. And that's the world we, we're, I'm glad we're here because that's what we're here to, to spread the word about is it's not the same. Everything's changed. And the best part is, is like, it's not just mind blowing to be here. It's it immediately inspires that imagination of how much more there is coming. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. When I, I first started this, I was explaining, this is like episode 60 or something around there. And when I first started this and I was telling people, oh, like we're in the pandemic, but we don't need to be trapped in our houses. You should come to the event in virtual reality. They're like, wait, what, what, are, you, what are you talking about? Like, that just, that's, that's like sci-fi stuff. It's like, no guys, it's happening. Like right now we're, we're here. You know, we, the, 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 the graphics are a little bit rudimentary, but you can sense that there's a person behind that graphic and that's what makes the difference is that feeling of presence. Um, cool. Great. Well, thank you so much, Nike, for the question. Rebecca had a question, but uh, it's it's fallen off. So if it ever comes back, let us know. How's it going, Reese Cup? 
Um, great. So let's uh, let's move on then. So uh, let's just hear a little more detail about the um, the projects that you're working on. Um, uh, sort of more specifically. So I know you guys are working with technology XR, which is mixed reality and all that kind of stuff. Um, do you want to go into a little more detail about what it is that you're you're studying? John, you want to kick it off? With, I'll go. I'll with go John. First, yeah. Um, so even though we're artists in residence, we're also, I'm a postdoc, so I have both a research position and an art, arts position. And years ago, I got into this because um, I got a hold of a HoloLens one, like right out of the gate, right? And it had this what, wonderful promise, and I put it on, and I was like, that's it? I can't, what, why can't I do anything in it? And I kind of started getting invested in building teams at UCSD that are interdisciplinary with undergrads, start developing new functionality. So a lot of what I do at present is um, functionality building for artwork experiences I hope to make that can't exist yet. And we're so, so close. We've been on a, a two-year effort to build infrastructure for like cloud-based rendering and cloud, what we call DevOps, like we're containerizing everything. Because even this doesn't fully run in a cloud. It has a cloud component, but you run a lot on a local device. And so all that compute power, all that networking, we um, have a lab founded by Tom DeFonte who invented DR Cave systems, as well as uh, graphical displays called Z graphs back in the day that was used to make all the Death Star graphics. So like mm. it's this lab that's still progressing using this compute end and that's what I'm doing. And that's because my main goal is for my physical, I want the physical um, space and the virtual space one-to-one -one, and I want your level of immersion from real all the way to fully immersed as we are now to be present at your choice. You peel away the onions at the layer, you stay in the layer you want, or you play in the layer with everybody else. And we're getting closer and closer to that. And once that's done, it's it's a whole globe of possibilities and uh, we're ever approaching faster. So that's, that sounds that's amazing. what we're doing right now. Yeah, Yeah. so, so, so it, it, before we go on though, I just wanted, so, because Mark Zuckerberg, of course, made this big announcement this week that he's turning the Facebook organization into a metaverse company, and he's now they're hiring hundreds of um, hundreds of, uh, of people to um, you know for their metaverse division. And I think one of the ideas was kind of to make a seamless transition between mixed reality, augmented reality, full virtual reality, and maybe it'll be in the same headset. Do you feel that that is something? he's headed towards or is that sort of what you're headed towards any instinct um, on that what we're headed towards and so every every company wants to do this i'm glad that um, they made that kind of dictate so that the company knows what everybody's doing the question is is where are they at with technology like oculus doesn't focus on the ar side or the network side right they're they're like a hardware company and they're leaving all what we call the middleware in between up to everybody else at this point so i don't know what their shift will be um mm -hmm. So th that'll be interesting. And the, the big thing is, is what we're all missing just as a, the, uh, is standards. There are no standards. So like the Microsoft HoloLens is spending way more money than Facebook right now. They don't make it public. They don't tell everybody about this, but we're in part of it. Like they're ramping up mesh. Mm -hmm. They want this as a full integration. Uh, they've mm -hmm. got a pretty heavy lock right now on wearable see-through AR um, that I don't really see any strong competitors with. Right. And that technology is was, really yeah. rudimentary still. So yeah. um the infrastructure will come before the mechanical engineering aspects, I believe. That's my personal thought. We'll have all the data infrastructures up in the next 10 to 15 years. Um, yeah, that's wow. That's what all the 5G so, companies are worried about. So it's kind of- Got it. So it sounds right, slow, so before... John. <laughs> 10 yeah. to 15 years, you um, think? <laughs> for infrastructure, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, do, uh, also, John, don't forget to put on Amplify Your Voice and Host Tools so everyone can uh, hear you. Properly, but I'm um, not sure where my host tools are. I normally have a host oh. menu. Oh, on the right, is there a host tools menu there? Maybe uh, not. Unfortunately, I can only raise my hand, which I thought was me waving. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, luckily, um, you luckily you sound okay to me. Unfortunately, maybe we could move up on the stage here, and everyone can have a. a, a I there we go. The virtual yelling. Hello. Hey <laughs> there. Hello out there. Hello, exactly. Hello. Um, all right, so we'll come back to that because I still have some I still have some questions about that. That it blows my mind what you're talking about. So, uh, but but Patrick, how, how about you? Let's let's uh, move on down the line here. Sure. So uh, so you know I'm sort of in the middle of a lot of different projects um, as an assistant director. 
Um, so I get to work with our artists and residents um, on a number of projects. Robert will tell you about his. John, you know, just told you about his. But we also have, um, you know, like I said, sort of research projects going in kind of neuro aesthetics. So how we process, um, you know, visual experience, music experience, um, other ways that we can use VR to augment uh, consciousness in ways that we can measure and study, you know, what those shifts are and better understand how it's being done. And then we can do it more deliberately and more consciously, um, as well as, you know, we have a, a psychedelics and health research initiative um, that's you know, one of the first in the nation looking at how psychedelics can treat chronic pain conditions, um, things like phantom limb pain, um, which we have a trial that's starting this fall. And then I'm very heavily involved in the, the sort of speculative culture side of the Clark Center. Um, so we host the Clarion Science Fiction Fantasy Writers Workshop um, every summer, except for the last two summers, unfortunately. Um, but that's uh, the oldest science fiction fantasy writers workshop in the United States. Uh, that's where Octavia Butler went. Um, back in like Harlan Ellison days, that's where oh. Kim Stanley Robinson, Kelly Link, Corey Doctorow, Nalo Hopkinson, you know, all these amazing people. That's one of the places that really helped them get their start. And oh. so each summer we bring um, 18 writers to UCSD. It's directed by uh, my faculty member, colleague, uh, Dr. Shelley Streeby. Um, and then we bring, you know, five uh, instructors from the writer community to come and work with them over six weeks. Um, and all these writers the last few years have just come out and are doing just amazing things in so many different ways. Um, you know, Carmen Maria Machado is kind of taking over the horror world and we've got people working on anime and TV shows and everything else. Um, and so that's been really, really exciting to kind of help um, steward some of some of that work. Um, and then within that, you know, we've done a number of, of um, sort of strategic foresight, world building, um, futures literacy programs, some for young people uh, and then others for um, for adults. We started doing some with UCSD graduate students, um, so using speculative techniques for you know, uh, global policy and strategy and things like that. And that's uh, where we first started working with, uh, with Tilt and Nine Key from Origami Air um, about two and a half years ago and uh, and then as we rolled into the pandemic we um you know they they came to us and said hey we want to do this thing and we were just super honored to you know get to jump aboard the airship literally with them um and and be a part of how they've taken all those sort of xr foresight or you know sort of foresight techniques and brought them into the metaverse and then how, how it's just kind of expanded into all of these other um possibilities um is is really exciting to me. I mean, I'm a very like community driven person, and um, and so now you know for us, you know, the potential to take all of these different communities and have like a common access point is what's really really exciting. Um, so we have you know, all kinds of speculative arts activity happening at UCSD, but um, Dr. Streeby uh, last year launched a UC wide speculative futures collective. And, um, and so now we've got that, we've got, you know, groups in the Bay Area. I was just talking yesterday to the Caribbean Futures Institute, and it's just, you know, the possibilities for bringing us all together to think in uh, unusual ways about the future, I think is really exciting, you know, to, to bring that kind of collective imagination to bear on, on problems. Um, to me, is like one of the things that gives me a lot of hope. Wow. That's awesome. And I, I, yeah, I was looking at your website and I think it was uh, Xixin Liu, the three body problem author was, uh, was a, a visitor at one point. These are like, these are heavy hitters. This is, uh, <laughs> those are amazing, amazing people that are uh, a part of that. Incredible. Yeah, that was, that was really amazing. So he got the Clark Award. So he was in DC and then um, came with John Scalzi to UCSD. Um, and we have a lot of, of um, Chinese um, students at, at UCSD, and so it was just uh, so fantastic to have 300 people in an auditorium. Unfortunately, even John was very kind of <laughs> humble about it, like not really to see John. They were here to see to see Dalu, and um, and he, you know, was speaking through a translator. So half the audience would laugh at the joke in Chinese, and then half the audience would laugh a couple yeah. seconds later. Um, that's the kind of thing that you know was even to do that was really difficult. 
but then you know a few months ago um you know in afterville we had a film screening and my friend and colleague from a, a sort of sister center for imagination in uh, in shenzhen you know he just showed up in avatar and we got to say hi right. for the first time in in two years um no travel no visas no bureaucracy um just wow. two people who love science fiction able to kind of connect totally that sounds incredible. Well, I've got I I because I, I do a lot of reggae. I have so many questions for you, with it, but um, I, I guess uh, let's just let's move on. Maybe I'll come back to some at the end because uh, we I could spend an hour here just talking about that stuff. Um, Robert, do you wanna do you wanna touch on what you're up to? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So the main <clears throat> I'm trying to think a couple different things, I guess, but. Um, uh, the one Patrick has alluded to a couple times is this art and empathy project, which I'm working on with a collaborator, Ying Wu, who's a cognitive scientist and writer and <laughs> et cetera at UCSD. But um, we're studying, working with the San Diego Museum of Art, studying how people um, you know, experience art and, and starting with paintings, but using things like EEG, eye tracking, you know, heart rate variability measures, in addition to like external sensing, um, but kind of, you know, which I think is kind of like a, like a quixotic pursuit or something like as an artist, you know, it's like, how much insight are you going to get into art from that on the one hand, but then also like, let's dig as deep as we can, you know? Um, and, and one, so, so part of that is like, I'm interested in kind of the sensing and analysis, um, and the big questions, but also we're working on a generative art side. So looking at kind of like, um, you know, how, <clears throat> How can we use the kinds of data analyses that we're doing insights to drive like using things like GANs or text to image translation networks? You know, how can we generate new forms of of art that are generated by or driven by kind of our our you know uh, cognitive or biological responses to things? So I think interesting frontiers there. Um, other thing, the the other project is this embodied coding project um also with the same collaborator so she's she it'd be great if she were here um but um and for that we're really we're looking at for anyone who's ever tried you know visual programming like scratch or um, axmsp you know things like in, instead of programming with text we can program with like nodes and and graphs and links and kind of do a visual programming and so we're we're building something like that but uh, through an NSF, kind of a three-year funded NSF project, but particularly like focused on embodiment, uh, kind of spatial representation, spatial memory. You know, if we represent code as structures in space, you know, what what kind of benefits does this provide for people who are learning to code? Um, and and so I think that's that's a really interesting. It's a really promising project for me because it connects to so many things. It's like you know, I was talking about robots or Internet of Things. You know, it's like like kind of these spatial interfaces and programming, you know, programming things through spatial interfaces is sort of where we'll be going as we have more like VR, AR, you know, Snapchat spectacles or whatever, and we can like turn our coffee on. You know, hopefully we do something better than that. But um, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so so those, those are kind of the main ones. And then you know, I do. A lot, I'm really interested in this, like at the Center for Imagination, kind of human and machine imagination. So I've been doing a lot of stuff with like, creative AI and sort of. What can we learn? You know, what comparisons can we make uh, productively between like, machine imagination and human imagination? So, oh wow, yeah, yeah, amazing. That's I mean, it's, I, again, it's like I, I think each of you I could I, we could have a whole hour on. So, um, that's it. Uh, yeah, I, that sounds uh, pretty amazing. If anyone uh, has any questions here for these guys before we move on, let us know. Mason or Wicker, nice to see you, patience. Uh, we got Brem Caesar up here and uh, a bunch of bunch of folks. So um, we do have. Uh, let's see here. We may have one question uh, from Brem Caesar. What's happening, Brem? Oh no, sorry, I did that by accident. I don't know what I'm doing. It's the first day. This okay, cool no problem. World, well, welcome. Yeah, thank you and welcome. We're we're, we're happy to be uh, one of the people you meet on your first day. I think you came into a good place. You got some incredible folks here. Um, all right, Rebecca. How's it going, Rebecca? Hey, everyone. This is just a, such a great conversation, and thank you. And I just wanted to, uh, for the moment, I was curious if you all have been to an alt space, the Connected Experience. Uh, it's a really fabulous platform. It's you know, it's a world put on by Brian Kravitz, who leads some events here. And the exciting thing is he and his group have created, you know, there's a sculpture, uh, but they've got um, in the back end, 
the hookup to MIDI with a simple heart rate um, uh, heart rate sensor, fingertip kind, and it's just a very simple MIDI up, up or down. It's not anything more complicated. And then on the sculpture that you stand inside, it's changing color, you know, and light. And so they're they're working on some really great stuff. Um, so, anyways, I just wanted to to toss that out there for folks who might be interested. Yeah, that sounds fabulous. Yeah, thank you. That's awesome. Amazing. Um, cool. Well, I guess uh, I have a you know I I have a few questions, but why don't we move on to the future? And if we have time at the end, maybe I will uh, maybe I will ask each of you one of those questions. But this is, we've we've sort of been touching on it because obviously you guys are basically living in the future. So, but let's 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 go a little bit further out. Where do you think this is headed ten years from now, fifteen years from now? I mean, how do you see this all happening? I know, John, you sort of touched on it with the projects you're working on. Um, do you want to you want to start us off? I mean, we sort of talked about how you're going to have the mixed reality, augmented virtual. Do you think that like that will be like? You're in your kitchen uh, in the real world, but you've got on your glasses so you can make dinner while you're talking to an avatar who's next to you, uh, who happens to be in alt space. Is that how you're sort of seeing things when you talk about one-to-one? -one? Um, a little bit. I mean, a lot of the inspiration, and there's no way we could get through this without mentioning it, is uh, if you've not read Werner Vinge's Rainbow Zend, he talks a lot about like the wearable, what the technology is that supports a whole world of it. and there's a bunch like not everybody wants to wear glasses. I just got LASIKs this year partially because I'm in VR so much and I'm tired of my glasses like cutting my face and things like that. So the, the question really for these interfaces partially is a design challenge for what how do people want to be in them is going to be based on their comfort. And so this is the one of the most exciting things for me coming from the visual arts background and my minor in undergrad was um, graphic design and I've taught graphic design and product development through like rapid prototyping for a while now is these spaces aren't explored yet. And like there's at the university level, it's really easy to see the, the I use the word fervor because that's the best way for me to describe it. They're like bundles of energy, like frothing to get at this world to expand their vision of it because they're already imagining in it. And that's, that's where I really see in 15 years, I don't think there's a way to predict it. Any prediction we make is going to be wrong. And when it comes to wearables, it's going to come down to, to function and use and ease of adoption. So I used to give events where I would go to a couple elderly centers just to see and experience them. And there's this right here is easy enough to put on that there are how many people in their 60s and 70s with Oculus Quest 2s now. And just bringing down the price point and the comfort level was enough during the pandemic to, to open it up to everybody. So I don't want to make a prediction of the future other than that I'm excited for it. And I'm really looking forward to how we're going to integrate the physical portion of it, the somatic side, with the rest of these displays that we have now. Because the display technology isn't new. It's just cheap. Right. So I don't. So that would be my yeah. take there. Got it. Yeah, well, that makes sense. And, 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 you know, I think there was, I think I'd read somewhere with your guys's with the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation about that we, we invent the future, like we bring it into being by imagining it and then moving forward to try to create something of it. So having an optimism about the future, you're going to infuse the future with a, a positivity and an optimism. So, you know, even that alone uh, is, is, is great. Um, and then open to all possibilities, like you're talking about being open to nonsense uh, can can expand what happens, right? That makes absolutely makes sense. Um, Patrick, do you wanna do you wanna jump in? Do you think? Maybe you, Robert, <laughs> you you wanna take it first? I'm I'm the least technical person here, so I'll I'll draft off of your predictions. <laughs> yeah, I might. Um, and the angle I've been most interested in has to do with like cohabitation and how we're all like kind of like all that means, you know, ha habitation, habitus, like living together, shared space, intimate space. So I think your example, Graham, was really nice. Like, yeah, may cooking, maybe cooking dinner and your glasses are on and you're like spending time with someone else. Um, also makes me think about Patrick's story that like, like we've all been living, I'd say a very experientially impoverished time together with Zoom and not in person, but with Patrick's story, like, like even right now, there's a space for like physical gesture and kind of embodied presence so i would say like you know for me the angle of kind of presence together and a cohabitation is interesting 
um, and where we're going. And I think that that takes a lot of forms. It can be like people to people, but it could also be um, you know, the machines and the systems that we share space with or the other non-humans, you know, animals, like <laughs> plants, all are neglected, you know, non-human others. So um, that's pretty conceptual maybe, but but I think, I mean, the technology will keep churning. So I think it's like, what are we, you know, how are we thinking about how we're living with it? And I think, I think thinking broadly about it is kind of like a lived praxis or like a, you know, space and time together with these systems and new ways to be together, I think is an interesting kind of mm. place to, to try I, to go. I wonder also if it's like, if identity is more fluid, right? So what if people identify um, with a plant in the future? What if they identify with a banyan tree or something like that, and they can embody that in virtual space? It's kind of an interest, like it just really expands what we can be as our, a person, as an identity. Yeah, I mean, we we were chatting on Discord before this, and you and Patrick are going, or Twitter maybe, and going back and forth about like, um, is it me or a chatbot that's going to show up? Or is it like a right. banyan tree with like sensors on it? You know, like, right. like I, yeah. uh plasticity is really fascinating and maybe could broaden what we feel connected to totally yeah and cool. i mean i can just kind of build off that a little bit you know that um you know i think because of the clark part of our name we tend to think about imagination in terms of how we think about the future and that's an important part of what we do and and we really feel that the 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 sort of literacy in futures and these the sort of multiplicity of futures that are possible um, gives people more power to shape their their path to that future. And so that is a really important part. But imagination is also the thing that allows me to potentially have some sort of empathy or compassion with you. I mean, I don't have direct access to your thoughts. I have your words, I have your gestures, and then imagination kind of fills in the gaps. And some of the the playing that Robert and I have done with you know generative AI, that's part that's really exciting. Is you know at what point do you start to, um, in your imagination, grant this machine some attributes of personhood um, and some attributes of maybe intelligence, wisdom, creativity, rights, and that it does extend you know to the natural world and our planet. And so I'm also you know very much not in the prediction business, um, but I I do think there's something to be said for you know communities like this coming together and finding ways to be with one another and and um, and do so in this very you know kind of positive way. You know I think a lot about you know this I and mean, we're talking specifically like the future of the metaverse here. You know, like early days of Fortnite, you know it was what within six months there was an army of two hundred thousand fourteen year old neo Nazis that one oh, one God. fourteen year old had sort of marshaled right. Right. and. Um, you know, and I think we I'm sure we will see ugliness in the metaverse as well. But it's this is the beginning, you know, I mean, obviously this has been kind of coming for a long time, but still it's early days. And so there's still, you know, what it is and sort of substrate of it is still fungible. And so the more that we all collectively like have a hand in that and we don't just hand it off to Mark Zuckerberg, or we don't just hand it off to, to any one person, um, the more chance there is for it to be a more equitable place, a more transformative place, a place that is connected to the very real, you know, political, ecological challenges that we face on the planet. Um, and so, you know, I think it has to be this sort of virtuous circle of imagination from the the meta to the real and back in. Yeah, amazing, cool. Um, I have I have two two thoughts uh, out of that, but let me see if, if anyone here has any uh, questions uh, before we move on. Fly Diver, nice to see you, Wicker and Tamer and NJ, everyone. Uh, if anyone has any questions, use the raise hand option, uh, and then we'll we'll call on you. Um, so, you know, here's 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 two sort of dilemmas that I see, especially sort of what you're talking about, Patrick, is like where you know we already have this problem on like Twitter where they're talking about. What can you censor? And is is Twitter actually a utility now? Because everyone is on Twitter, and so it should be. Should it just be a utility that is controlled and and confined? Uh, but then, who is the one who is able to do the blocking of the voices we don't want to hear? And who and can that very quickly turn into a sort of dictatorial authoritarian space? And you could see how a place like the metaverse is is prone to that, right? Like somebody controls the code someone controls everything that happens in here um and there have been you know 
people that have trolled through this event or other events that I've been to in alt space that have special access uh, through family connections or something, and they are able to uh, hack through different events. Like we have a, a stage blocker up here right now um, so that we can speak without people jumping in our faces. Um, but I've had people get through the stage blocker because they had some kind of a hack. So, and so the question is like, how, what do you control? Do you have safe spaces? Do you have more open spaces? Who does the, who does the defining of the rules? Um, there's so much to think about. <laughs> And if you I'd love to hear John talk outside. about this. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> well, I grew yeah. up, uh, my mom was uh, worked in a labor law firm as a secretary, and I love I love the legal side of policy and things. I'm a huge nerd for that too, and that's where if I were to make a prediction of the future and where we're going to see a lot of change, it's going to be on policy side because these connective issues are only just now being realized as the threat that they are at, to society and privacy. Number one. And we already have some pretty crappy privacy laws. And those privacy laws aren't, weren't, they were written in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Like, it's illegal for you to record audio in a park, but I can take your video and audio just fine. Because the mm. understanding was back then the camera was too mm. big to hide, and not everybody had one in their pocket. The microphone was small. So we don't have any of that now. And nobody's really even broaching the subject hardly. And these spaces are way bigger security risks than your email. Because there's so much network traffic on these with so many different hops, and there's so many places to inject uh, code. So just for your Bluetooth, like your Bluetooth has to be packaged with your headset and sent if you're not using a hardline system. And in that, there's tons and tons of packages, there's tons of protocols, and each one of those is a non-secure protocol, no matter what they say. So there is no security right. in this system. I don't right. want to scare was, you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, Graham, I was thinking about John about your work, like kind of building open source tools and kind of democratizing access to these sorts oh, of platforms, that. like machine learning and the rest of it. But I mean, I think I mean it, to me, it seems like I mean, I've, as an artist, I've greatly benefited and teacher like from open source tools of all all varieties. And I think like you know, we're in alt space, right? Owned by Microsoft wearing, I'm wearing a Facebook manufactured headset. So I think, um, let's, <laughs> let's think about that, right? Like what, you know, how, you know, what, what, what would an open source or kind of community sourced or self-developed, you know, metaverse be, um, how can it be a DIY thing? On the one hand, we're occupying this corporate tool in a different way, in a new way. And, and you all, I'm sure, you know, everyone has, answer the lines of communities through these tools. So I think that's one way to do it. Um, I think, um, yeah, yeah, so. Uh, to that point, one, one fun yeah. fact about research is that like all of this is possible because of something called OVR, which is a driver for stereoscopic rendering. And that was an open source package that was developed for research through universities and put into the world and adopted. So like, I mean, we exist through the open source now as a foundational mm. tool. I was thinking a, a flip side thing, yeah, yeah, a flip side thing for this embodied coding thing. We did a, a spring break project with a bunch of undergrads at UCSD that were all over the place because no one was at school, and um, we gave them headsets, like loaned them headsets, and some of it was like design experiments for like interacting with these code systems, and we tried to do it through like WebXR, you know. So like there are standards for kind of XR, VR, you know, that are that are somewhat democratized or shared across platforms, and um, we also hit some hard limitations, but it was the first time I was like, I was like, oh man, let's let's work on this because it'd be awesome to like be able to like distribute something to you know thousands of users around the world to like do some design experiment in VR distributed way across all of our different contexts, you know. So I think there's a there's a real bright future there too. It's sort of how do we you know make it happen, right? So open open source decentralized. Uh, Oasis basically is what we need. Somebody, whoever's out there, you guys on the panel, please, please do this before we have a Facebook IOI dystopic future. We don't want that. Um, all right. Yeah. So I got a question. I mean, from... <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, I mean, even like, you know, there was the, the interview with uh, Zuckerberg this week, you know, about this pivot of Facebook to, to metaverse. And, you know, he's talking about, and I, I don't think he's wrong at some point, I'm not going to put like a year count on it. You know, we will be living much, much more of our lives on the metaverse. 
we we still can't even get high speed internet to to everyone today. You know, people who are living in rural areas, reservations, the list goes on and on and on. It's already, you know, there's huge equity problems just to participate in today's society and economy. And so, you know, I think there's a real risk that this really just gets more and more, you know, this, this gap gets wider while our income equality gaps are getting wider. And it's really bad in all kinds of ways for social cohesion. And so I think like you know, open source tools, um, you know, super cheap hardware that you can 3D print and sort of fab lab together. All these things are like, they're kind of like hacker tropes, but they're really powerful ones for a reason because it can maybe address these challenges in a way that's not just waiting for a mega corporation to kind of airdrop some headsets into your, into your community. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so let's uh, take a question from Wicker here before we move on. Wicker, are you here? Yep, I'm here. How's it going? Uh, I was just going to ask if uh, I'm not sure John has a megaphone when he talks. He's really quiet. Yeah, we seem to um, we seem to not be able to solve that on the fly. Unfortunately, we are aware. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think it's I think because I, I I made him a host after the event began and I didn't I don't know it, it somehow he doesn't have the host tools and I uh, we have no other way of doing that we'll just have to have John come right up to the front here and oh. and yell into the audience. here but you thank you yell, thank I you can, I can yell thank you Wicker uh, is that it Wicker you just you're just uh, technology wanted to make sure work. that okay got it. All right, uh, Mason. Mason has something here. What's up, Mason? Hi. Um, I know uh, some therapists, psychologists that are in all space. They're doing things where they're saying that this is for um, it's a therapeutic, but they make it clear that well, we're not practicing therapy in all space because we could lose our license. And when I asked more, well, why why can't you do therapy in all space? It's um, there's like a presence of feeling that there's another person. And they said, well, because this is not a HIPAA compliant platform. We can't even do therapy over Zoom. We have to have a special web portal that's designed by somebody and it's triply encrypted. And I was wondering, do you think that um, there's needs to be a security encryption, some kind of wake up call in um, virtual reality, uh, something like that? Because even if I'm in Horizons or in here, I'm talking with my friends, I don't feel like it's completely private. Like in Horizons, Facebook could be dropping in and I guess, I think they warned that they'll have moderators listening. So is there some type of like, <laughs> you think there will be like an open source encryption thing um, in, in the future or some kind of security wake up call? Question. Is that question posted to a specific person? Uh, so I, I, so it's an interesting thing because I work on we work on this like server side stuff and like cloud distribution. And one of the things we did early on, the the main engineer was make our cluster um, HIPAA compliant, and then we immediately took it away because it it leads to too much legal liability. Because the simple fact of the matter is the amount of DD, like the amount of tax that we get every day is insane. Like the amount of people trying to break into our websites, our institution through the school, and so we don't want to put anybody's uh, things at risk. And so the the one thought and philosophy is make everything open, and then you don't ever have to have anything to worry about, right? That doesn't work in reality. We all need a place. It's why we have a home. That's why we have a bedroom. That's why we all go lock the door in the bathroom just to get away from the kids if you need to, is to have two seconds of privacy. And the big thing is, is do you need to know if your privacy is being invaded to give it up? Or do you need to guarantee that it's secure? Because the easiest way to say it's secure is I take this off. I mean, your phone records, Verizon, AT&T, everybody has your phone records. The Alexas, oh, have any of you ever tripped your, uh, tripped your Alexa while you're here in VR talking to somebody? Have you gotten a response from across the room? You know, and those things take you out of this feeling of immersion. And so... For us to really feel safe and comfortable, there's going to have to be a guarantee. And one of those guarantees comes from complexity. So one of the ways that we get safety now is because there's just too many people in the world with cameras that we can't look at all the footage until all of a sudden computing takes a leap forward and AIs take a leap forward is like the speculation. So there's, there's, an impo there's no answer to that question. And it comes down to 
kind of a threshold and range for your privacy. Like this is your your realm of expectation from full privacy to to being completely um, thrown into jail and having to look to Ecuador to save you inside of a UK stronghold. Um, to where we want to operate is somewhere in the middle, right? Where you're comfortable. You're comfortable giving up this much privacy on this side so that you can use the services that it provides and the access to the community, the people, the education, the, the family, the, the funds. And anything outside of that range is where we really have to dig into with like policy issues. And that's where we build trust. So um, it's an impossible problem with an impossible solution right now. We, the only way we solve any of those is through imagining. We have to imagine what, what can be done. Oh. I hope that answers Anything your question. Ah, yeah. oh, great. Um, great. Okay, let's uh, let's just. Uh, to, Wicker's got something else here. Let's see what Wicker has to say. Okay, I, I actually have a question. <laughs> uh, um, you you think we need need to imagine uh, the kinds of things we need to do before it gets to the point, or do you think it's gonna end up a cut and try thing, or something gonna get set in place that are just all wrong, like like what happened in the 1950s, the precedent for uh, what you were talking about earlier, the recording audio and, and video. Oh, good question. What comes first, the solution or the problem? <laughs> Anyone have any ideas? Mm. It's a tough I, one. I, 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 for, I think it's a really hard ahead. question. And I think the maybe unsatisfying <clears throat> answer is that those two things are constantly, uh, you know, working with each other, you know, in our culture and cross cultures all the time. And, you know, it's not so much just a simple matter of, you know, like, let's, let's just sit in a room and we'll imagine an alternate solution that will solve all of our problems. And then we can just, you know, have happy, peaceful lives. I think it's, it's more, you know how our our imaginings and our our images of for what we want to see can guide us to do things now, even if it's you know emailing a senator or emailing your your local rep when there's you know a new bill being debated or when you know uh, you know, signing up for different you know technology advocacy advocacy group mailing list to see when there's a privacy you know bill coming through the coming through Congress and finding ways to kind of make like what you would want to see, start to kind of realize it in the world. Because imagination is, we think, is very powerful. We're the Center for Human Imagination, but it has to be connected to you know, what what we're doing in the moment. And so that's happening all around us. I think the the problem is that it hasn't reached the kind of critical mass to kind of break through all the factors that are inhibiting some of this change. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And you know, it, I think it's also that. Um... I don't know if we can foresee all the problems that will arise. It's almost like when, you know, it's like that idea, a butterfly flaps its wings in Brazil and there's a hurricane in Miami. It's like, how could you possibly predict all of that? So it's like some of the problems that, you, you know, that we were talking about, like privacy issues and all that are here now, but there are other issues that I don't even think we've imagined yet, right? And so it's like, I, I think you're, you're probably right that it's, it's, a, it's a dance, it's an interplay you try to solve something one way and then there's another uh, hole that leaks in your boat and then you got to plug that. And it's kind of like the whole idea of like, well, who thought that, uh, you know, Facebook uh, creating in a boardroom somewhere, a rule that everyone can put an ad on Facebook, and then that affects the elections of U the US elections. Like who would have exactly that? You know, unless you're a, a devious mastermind, maybe maybe uh, Zuck is, but who knows? But I think that it's some of these things are accidental and we're tripping our way through it. and. Hopefully, as it goes, we'll evolve along with it and make a better, better world. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, maybe the, maybe the best thing to do it. Yeah, maybe maybe the best thing to do is cultivate a sensitivity about what we're giving, how our data is used. How, you know, like kind of like in in the users of technologies. That I think some of those 
sensitivities and awarenesses are portable across platforms and across new technologies. Um, I was thinking, Patrick, did you say you came up in, in like interactive fictions or like BBSs or AOL Instant Messenger or something? Yeah. In intro? Yeah. You know, I was thinking like, I remember that. I remember like Instant Messenger and you know, what, what was being scooped up then? Like the, you know, the... <laughs> kind of, you know, Snowden NSA surveillance didn't exist at that point, right? Did it? <laughs> you know, like what? Yeah. Like, you know, yeah, I don't know. I think in, in my case, they scooped up the 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 understanding that I somehow believed that a mon calamari and a human could produce offspring, which is uh, maybe really <laughs> troubling. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, just to, uh, to underscore this point too, with uh, you know, I think you know all of these points that Roberts just made, you know, and, and here we talk about imagination in this positive way so much, but you know, imagination is also responsible for dystopian visions for the future, which can be really helpful for us you know, spotting problems, but can also you know, cause us to feel defeated um, when we feel like you know, the climate change is gonna run away, we can't stop it, society's gonna disintegrate, might as well just eat some Cheetos and watch some Netflix and chill. <laughs> And so, you know, <laughs> Netflix or I imagination can, it cuts both directions. Imagination is responsible for depression, anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, so even in a place like this, you know, it's, it's that finding that way to kind of see some possibility where it's easy to think, you know, it's, we, it's already done, it's out of our hands, and we just have to kind of take whatever we get. Right. Absolutely. That might be uh, the perfect uh, place to to wrap it up. Uh, so, guys, before um, we let you go, uh, how can people get in touch with you in the real world to find out more about what you're doing and your ideas? Start with John. Oh my God, um, I I'm trying to hide from all social media and all things. My UCSD published my phone number a while back and my uh, email address, <laughs> so I'm sure those are still online. If you look. <laughs> <laughs> so my email is through uh, jpayden at ucsd.edu. I have a website, jonathanpayden.com, that um, isn't very active, but it's still there. I'm trying to start a new blog, so maybe that'll happen soon. John, we we also had our... Through the Clark Center email. <laughs> we'll we, UCSD also published our dates of birth and social security numbers, or at least they were hacked out, right? Twice in the last... <laughs> it's true. Months. Yeah. Don't worry. We have a year's worth of credit reporting uh, protection. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the Clark Center is, uh, it's on the internet, imagination.ucsd.edu. Uh, we're on we're on Twitter and Facebook, marginally. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, if anyone wants to get in touch, I'm uh, pcoleman at ucsd.edu is my email address. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's me. You, Robert? Yeah, um, Patrick and Graham are like my only two friends on Twitter. But yeah, Robert Toomey, RobertToomey.com <laughs> if you want to see. I put most of, I would love if anyone wants some art projects and reach out at some point. So Robert Toomey, uh, whatever. Um, so yeah, great. Thanks for coming, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah we're thank you. Big fans of shipping a bottle, you know. I'm sorry, note in a bottle. Not shipping a bottle. Note in a bottle, oh, right, 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 right. <laughs> right. Um, well, guys, this has been awesome. I, I honestly could keep you for another two hours here. We have so much to, to talk about, but I'm so glad you could make it. And thank you, Tilt, for uh, introducing us and allowing this to happen. Let's, uh, let's give a round of emoji love for, for Tilt over here, who is a uh, connector extraordinaire. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, you guys are uh, really uh, fascinating and have a lot of really interesting ideas, and I'm so glad that um, I could get you out to uh, our audience, and uh, hopefully they'll, uh, you know, reach out and and reciprocate. Um, so, uh, so thank you for. Yeah. So go ahead. What were you gonna say? No, thank thank you for having us and for letting us be a part of this, you know, this podcast virtual space that that you've created. This has been super fun. Oh, absolutely. Uh, great. Yeah. Well, thank you for teleporting into this worldcast of Simulation Nation. Whether you're with us in virtual. Like these fine folks here or 2d for watching the video on youtube on our simulation to channel or listening to the podcast on spotify or apple Podcasts. and remember to subscribe to our instagram at the simulation nation twitter at simnation vr facebook and discord and if you enjoyed this event 
please give us, a, give us a five rating in all space for all you people in the audience here. And if you didn't enjoy this, please don't share the hate. Uh, <laughs> anyways, join, join us uh, next uh, time for our interview with the real life pastor uh, uh, about bringing spirituality into the metaverse with VR Church. I hope uh, promise to be a very interesting conversation. Until then, stay plugged. Oh, my awesome. Friends. Yeah. yeah. All right. Cool. Well, okay. everyone, don't don't escape just yet. Uh, we got to get Woo! over to the uh, the float and float and whatever and get a picture of everyone here. So. <laughs> okay. How about now? Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the the me, uh, let repeat. me get in there and then the get my pod over repeat. to take a good picture. <laughs> it's the virtual red carpet, all right. Load in click. Patrick, I want to try. I want to. I want to try scream into the void today. Oh yes, you should. That's my favorite. It's the so, float. Till, you got to get in there this time. You're always out taking was the it, picture. I got my bot here. He's going to be like taking the picture this time. Something else. Yeah, Tilt, come on in. Tilt, get in there. Get in there, everyone. Oh, yeah, More yeah, the merrier. I, you know, I, I think it was repeat. You know. Yeah, I don't think I was that creative. <laughs> uh, I, you know, <laughs> I play the all creative. <laughs> so. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Like, well, snuggly. Yeah. here we go. There's the there's the panel. We got everyone. Hello. All right. <laughs> all right, everyone, hop in. Come on, everyone, get in here. You guys are all members of Simulation Nation now. This is. Uh, <laughs> come on down. We got yeah, Afterville on here. We got uh, Arthur C. Clarke. We got Simulation. Hey, so everyone, hop on in. Hi. Yeah. Oh, Great that? job, guys. Yeah. 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 Really Thanks for coming. Yeah. This was awesome. How are you, how are you doing? Doing okay. Can't okay. yeah. step to your left okay. a little bit. Oh. Yeah. Better than All I right. thought it would do, but hey, yeah, I'm just kind crazy. Of hey, everyone, give it a yeah. emoji for a uh, hero for here. A like in the middle of gram. There you go. There you go. Yay! Yay. 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 Very cool. Very cool. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. We got it. Very cool. Yay. All right. Great show tonight, guys. All right, guys. Awesome. Yay. And hopefully this it's music isn't going to be too loud. We'll see. I guess. Scream into the <laughs> void. Ah! Oh, yeah, of course. You sing. Have you? I think it's these guys here. So uh, a lot of people here are mem of members of Afterville. So Phil's is a big uh, player there. Nice They're Afterville folks. And all of our panelists and actors are part of that as well. So, uh, yeah. The Gen Father is as well. Yeah. For now, hey. those are the two options. Oh, yeah, yeah otherwise, no. <laughs> well, Graham, I just oh, want well. to say thanks again. This was uh, oh, I, I this was super fun. Around, it's really yeah, good to absolutely. meet you and um, absolutely. see see what you're doing here. Oh yeah, I'm so so glad you could make it. And I yeah, I had so many questions about your this these workshops you're doing and like, I I, I want to get into the the geeky writer stuff. So, you know, figure like. How structured are they, and how do you how do you guys approach it? And I have so many questions, uh, but I figured it wasn't good for show. But um, yeah, well, we, let's find some other time to chat. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure, I'll send you send you some some messages on Twitter or something like that as well. Sounds yeah, cool. yeah, or you know, we're connected on Discord.